Good morning, everybody. Glad to be with you today, although sorry that Pastor Ken is feeling a little under the weather. So uh, you'll have to suffer with me today. I am glad to be here. I've been looking forward to an opportunity to share my heart with you. Um, and especially picking up on the themes that Pastor Ken started developing last week about this all-in thing, which has really got me thinking, and I hope it's gotten you thinking. Um, he used this phrase, and he challenged me, he challenged us, to reflect on what it might mean to be all-in. And one of the reasons that I'd been thinking about this, of course, is because I confess, and I don't imagine that I'm the only one that has this experience, but there are times where I'm feeling kind of all in, kind of. I don't know if you can, if you're feeling kind of all in, are you all in? <laughs> Just occurs to me, that doesn't make any sense at all. It's a good way to start. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> and then there are times where I might be less all in. I don't know if that makes sense, where I may be more about all me and less about all in. So there are times in my life where my commitment and devotion might waver. I do take great, great comfort in these thoughts, though, this one in particular that uh, we learned about, we heard about some really remarkable people last week, but I'm glad that I don't have to be a missionary like Elliot or Saint. I don't have to be an evangelist like Moody to be all in. All in is not limited to a very small sphere of things that you might do or that I might do. Um, those people changed history. They made a big difference in this world and in their communities. But those callings are not the measure of being all in. Anyone can be all in. Anyone. And I hope that you hear that. That was an encouragement to me that I don't have to be this superstar thing to be all in. We can be all in. One of my frustrations with myself, though, is that I kind of find myself at times doing this really silly, celestial, hokey-pokey dance with God, where I put my right hand in, then what do I do? Yeah, I take it out. And I put it in and I even shake it all about. <laughs> and there are times where I uh, put my whole self in. I mean, that's good. We're getting toward the end of the song. We put our whole self in and then I just might take my whole self out, put my whole self in, and I do turn myself around. And then I pop back out again. Some of you may have hokey pokey lives like mine. I fear that there are times, there are periods, there are stretches in my life where it's just hokey pokey. And, um, and I have trouble keeping my whole self in all the time, even though I want to. But you know, I'm not, I'm not the first person to struggle with that. Um, Paul said that there were times that he didn't do the things that he wanted to do. And he did do the things that he didn't want to do. That sounds a little hokey pokey to me. And if God loves Paul even when he's doing the hokey pokey, God loves us. And that's it, actually. Um, I rest on the truth that God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. And friends, that's what it's all about. And by the way, I apologize for the earworm. Some of you are going to have that in the car on the way home, aren't you? You just won't be able to help it. You go, oh, that guy. Pastor Ken, we need you. <laughs> in Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 17, this is one of my favorite verses, both because it's very, very encouraging to me and because it's challenging to me. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, Paul exhorts us to be all in, all in. And he says, whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever 
you do, that's an encouragement to me. Whether you're a pastor or a politician or a teacher or a tradesman or a homemaker or a house builder, you can be all in. Whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. By the way, if you do that in whatever place you are now, if you do that, you will change history. Now, it might not be written about in a mission magazine, or it might not be written about here or there or there, but you will change history as you engage the people around you. You will change lives in ways that are imperceptible, in ways that you don't know, that God sees and that he will use. As he redeems us, you'll make history. For those of you uh, who are guests or who don't know me, again, my name is Stephen, and my wife and I have called Calvary our church home for about 12 years now. Um, In that time, in those 12 years, the journey of my life has taken a lot of twists and turns, and I've shared some of those here before. Um, I'm currently a special education teacher, um, but most of my professional life has been spent teaching in Bible colleges. Um, Now, before you might think to yourself, wow, Bible colleges, that's really impressive. Know that I did not teach Old Testament or New Testament or ministry or theology, um, not the cool stuff. I taught the stuff that nobody came to Bible college to take. Nobody. Nobody. I taught math and English. <laughs> I hear you. Um, I taught writing with, a, with some emphasis on grammar. Yes. <laughs> and you know how popular I was. I was so popular that I had to remind my students how popular I was. <laughs> and they would just look at me with eyes rolling like, oh, so popular. I have something to say about that, though. This is important. Uh, While people didn't come to Bible college to study grammar or math, they should, because grammar and math both are about taking chaos and putting it in order, very much like the very first day of creation. So when we do math and grammar, we are doing God things. Whatever you do. Thank you for that amen. I don't know who said it, but I heard it. (laughs) Now, I'm going to ask you all a favor. Eyes closed. Eyes closed. I want to say, if you love math and grammar, eyes closed. No one can see it. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Solidarity. All right. Hands down. Eyes up. You are safe here, friends. We are not alone. Some of the math I covered in my class was pretty sophisticated. In fact, one of the things that we did that I really loved is we even studied ancient Egyptian and Chinese numerical systems. It was very cool. Very, very cool. Not all of the math was that exotic. Some of it was kind of review. And one of the things that we did for review was percentages. And so I brought a video of one of my teaching mentors and a lesson that he did on percentages. Who knew that percentages could be so inspirational? (laughs) I love that video. Uh, How many of you, by the way, have ever been asked to give 110%? That's 10% more than is humanly possible. Yeah. How many of you have ever asked somebody else to give 110%? Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. Um, 
It's hard. It's actually a really big idea, 100%, everything. That's a really big idea. So the question, one of the questions that I asked myself is, like, have I ever actually given 100%? Have I, have you ever given 100% to anything? To your family, to your job, to your church, to your ministries, to God? This is a question that I can't answer for myself. Well, I probably can't answer. I don't even know what it means, actually. I don't know what it would look like for me to give 100% to my family or 100% to my job or 100% to my church. Um, The thing is, Jesus is asking us. He's actually, he's not asking us. He is demanding that we give him 100%. And he, he tells us this frequently in Scripture. Last week, we, we read uh, with, with Pastor Ken from Luke chapter 9, Jesus' words. And, and we read, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their very self? Jesus wants everything. Um, And this isn't, I mean, we also read last week a couple passages later on in the Gospel of Luke that were even a little bit more, I don't know, they were stronger, worded in a stronger fashion, that you have to hate your mother and father. And we're saying, what? Um, But this isn't actually the most famous set of passages where Jesus is asking for everything. Perhaps the most well-known passage in which Jesus makes the demand for 100% to be all in is the greatest commandment. And it's interesting that Jesus' instruction had so many ands in it. Ands. Conjunctions are cool. Am I right? Can I get another amen? Somebody help me out here. Thank you. And you know that it had the best schoolhouse rock song, right? The very best one. I do love math and grammar. (laughs) I confess. So listen for the ands. Listen for the ands as we read from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard Jesus debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments... Which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And then there's an implied and here as we transition to the next verse. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and that there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And I love, love, love how Jesus responds to this. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. You are not far. You are near. You are close. You are just about all in. Among the concerns I have about myself as I reflect back at different times of my life or, or the church in North America or believers is that too often I fear that we treat this as if it's some kind of buffet where we get to walk down the mind aisle and we don't have to go down the emotions aisle or whatever it is that we can pick and choose from these things as if it's a menu But Jesus is not presenting us a menu. He's telling us and, this and that, all this and all that and all that and all that, not or. 
And in my life, every once in a while, I've slid in an oar. For example, we may focus on emotional experiences, but neglect the renewal of our minds. We want to feel things. I want to feel things. I want to come to church and feel things. I want to feel close to God. I want to feel inspired. I want to feel things. We want the music to move us, and we want the preaching to stir us. We want passion to flow through us. We want wow, and we want it now. I tell you, sisters and brothers, I I want wow too. In fact, the wow is good. I love the wow. But here's the question that I ask myself. What about when I'm not feeling the wow? I mean, if I'm, not, if I'm looking for this emotional experience, if I'm looking for someone to make me feel all excited, if I'm looking for emotional feelings, what about when I'm not feeling it? So, other than at this very moment, have you ever heard a sermon that left you waiting for the emotional wow? Does that mean in that moment, that God is less God or less good or less wonderful or less powerful or less worthy? Should I be trusting my faith or my eternity to my emotions, like how I'm feeling on any given day? Does that seem like a good idea? I mean, I'm a really emotional person, and I've learned not to trust them. Some of you may be like me. Some of you may be very different. The thought to me that I would let my emotions control my understanding of the presence of God is horrifying. I mean, if I only love God when I'm feeling good about God, what kind of love is that? Does that make sense? When we love or value our heart or our emotions at the exclusion of our thinking, of our minds, we are in peril. When we treat the and as an or, we're in trouble. And there have been parts of the church in North America and in all places in all times that have neglected the mind. We've not consistently valued knowledge. We've not consistently valued biblical education. We've too infrequently engaged in serious study Instead, of, instead, we continue to live on what Peter called spiritual milk, which is really good for babies. And if you are a new believer or a developing, if you're young in your faith, this is exactly what you need and you should feel awesome about it. If you are a mature believer growing in your faith after years of time spent with God, if you're still drinking spiritual milk, we got to develop a new dietary plan for you and me. Because that's good for babies, but it's not sufficient for adults. So if this is true, we are in danger of following false teachers, disreputable leaders, falling into any number of false teachings because we don't know better. Because that sounds like, well, that sounds just, that sounds like love, but that is not what God means by love or justice. We must remember what Paul says to the church in Corinth. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. Now, Jesus tells us that we must have the faith of a child, but he does not tell us that we should have the brain of a child. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. Paul is affirming that we got to know stuff and we have to be wise with what we know. It's not enough just to pile on a whole bunch of knowledge. And that's actually an equally dangerous um, trap, isn't it? We could be so dependent on emotions that we're just not thinking. Or we could be so dependent on thinking that we're just not feeling. We could know and learn and know and learn and know and learn and just accumulate this vast wealth of facts and knowledge. And we may do so to the extent that our faith seems a matter of lifeless, passionless information, irrelevant to the world. We could become obsessed with trivial theological debates 
We could know an awful lot and not be of any use to anybody, much less to the kingdom of God. We see this, unfortunately. We see this in groups and denominations that may be so caught up in thinking that they've lost any sense of wisdom and discernment. We see people who know a lot, but who really don't have a clue about what it means to live in the Spirit. So I tell you again, knowing is good. It is so good. I love the knowing. You know, I am a very curious person. People tell me that all the time. Stephen, you are really curious. But what about when I'm confused? What about when I don't get it? What about when I, when I get right next to the mysteries of God? Is he less God if I don't understand? Is he less good if I don't understand? If I can't sort it out? If I can't figure it? Is he less wonderful, powerful, worthy? Should I trust my faith or my eternity to my intellect? Gosh, that thought is even more horrifying than leaving it to my feelings. And I like school. I've been to school for a long time. We can't do that. When we value the mind at the exclusion of the heart, we're in peril. When we treat the and as if it's an or, we are in deep, deep trouble. So, Across the history of the church, we've seen groups that neglect the heart, using their minds to twist logic and teach, well, perhaps, well-meaning, but entirely contorted, unbiblical theology. And we're suffering for it. We see it in our lives, in our society, every day. So I mentioned these two ways we love God, with mind and heart. I haven't really addressed the other two, loving God with our soul or strength. And the ands matter here too. The ands matter here. And this one, I just love this notion. Loving God with our souls. If we look at the Hebrew word which is used here, it can be interpreted as kind of selfhood personality. So God wants me to love him by me being me. And God wants you to love him by you being you. In other words, I don't have to be D.L. Moody. Can I get an amen again? I need one. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have to be, I don't have to be a superstar, missionary, evangelist, preacher, teacher. I don't have to be any of those things if that's not what God has called me to do. And if you've ever felt like this stirring of guilt that you weren't something else, either God was trying to move you in a direction which is real and we must listen, or we might have had a notion that wasn't God's notion and we should not feel guilty for not doing that thing which God did not call us to do. He wants you to love him by being you. And I don't have to be you, and you don't have to be me, and the world is a better place for it. Use the unique gifts and talents that God has given you, and use them to his glory. Whatever you do, whatever you do, do it as for the Lord, giving thanks to the Father. Whatever you do, This brings us to strength, too. And Jesus is saying again, give it all, 100%. Go all in, whatever you do. So next time somebody, you say something to somebody, they just say, whatever. Okay. You want whatever? I got whatever. If the greatest commandment reminds us of nothing else, it should remind us that God wants 100%. I'm concerned that one of the reasons we see the Christian church losing influence in our society is that 25% of the people are giving 75% of their lives 50% of the time. And another 48% are giving 80% of their lives 60% of the time. And a mere 10% are giving 100% of their lives 91% of the time. While 17% aren't giving anything at all 83% of the time. I'm going to give you a minute to do the math. (laughs) Be sure to carry the three. (laughs) 
So one of the questions that I've been asking myself this week, and frequently, more fervently today, what am I giving today? Am I all in? Am I all in? And what does that look like in my life? Because my all in is not the same as Chris's all in. Right? Your all in is not the same as my all in. So we don't measure our all in by comparing ourselves to someone else. We measure our all in by comparing ourselves to the call of God on our lives, which may be very specific for you. In my life, it's not. In my life, it is a really big calling in the sense that God is saying, Stephen, whatever you do, whatever you do, do it for me. When I was a kid, I loved this uh, drink. I guess it was called a soft drink. It wasn't the fizzy kind. It was called high C. Any of you remember high C? <laughs> that tasted like the can? You know, you could get it in the big can. You'd get the high C in the big can, and you'd have to use the can opener to bust that bad boy open. And you'd pour it out. Mm, 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 mm. I don't know if high C is still on the market. Yes, it is. Is it? That's a pity, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it's, you're, you're a high C guy? I still love my high C. The problem with high C... Oh, am I out of battery? Again? <clears throat> what can I do here, Lexi? Just start talking. Just start talking? Yeah. Okay, we're, so, so the, the problem with high C, the problem with high C is that it's only 10% juice. 10% juice, and you might be thinking, 10% juice, that's okay. That means it's 90% not juice. That's not okay. 90% not juice. Some of my friends, though, they were Sunny D fans. Any Sunny D fans in the house? Yeah, 70% juice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so is it that much? 70% yeah. juice, which is better, of course, but it still begs the question, 30% not juice? 30% not juice. And then, of course, there is juicy juice. Juicy juice. I see some heads nodding. Yeah, juicy juice, 100% juice. That means what percent of it is not juice? 0%. We can do the math. 0% not juice. I think you do too, but I want to be a juice box hero with stars in my eyes. <laughs> Let's go all in. Whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So friends, best beloved of God. You should lean on that phrase, by the way, for you. For you, best beloved of God, for that is who you are. Best beloved. I want to give 100%. 100% of the time. And if it were humanly possible, I'd want to give 110%. 110% of the time, I really would like to be a juicy juice. How about you? I mean, what do you want to be? This is actually a really hard question. It's easy just to say, yeah, 100%, I'm good. But the choices that I make in my life betray the fact that I want to be 100%. Not every moment of every day, but it's true. What do you want to be? What kind of juice do you want to have in you? What do you want to give? Here's some suggestions for me, because you're just kind of stuck having to listen to what I'm thinking about, and I'm hoping that it resonates with somebody else. Here's some goals for me. You can share them where they apply for you. If you spend time in God's word and in his world with an attitude of affection and wonder, you will grow in love with all your heart for God. If you take time to pray and devote yourself to righteousness and grace, you will grow in love with all of your soul for God. If you diligently study the word with the expectation that you will know and understand our great God more completely, you will grow in love with all your mind for God. If you participate 
if we participate in church and personal ministries with open hearts, we will grow in love with all of our strength for God. And if we understand this, and if we do it, we will grow in our love for our neighbors. It's about the ands. It's about the ands. It's about God's desire for all of you and for all of me. 100%, 100% of the time, all in, whatever we do, all in. So here's the cool, cool good news at the end. If this is what you know and this is what you long for, you, best beloved, are not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far. I'm not far. We're in. So I have some points to ponder. They'll go out in the email um, that I hope that you receive to help reflect on the day so that church isn't some drive-by event, but something that we can think about all week long. And these are actually really serious questions. What kind of juice do you want to be really, truly, honestly? Because I can answer that question, and then when I add really, truly, honestly, I have to think about it. How can I understand my vocation, the stuff that I do every day, in terms that I can sincerely say, I'm doing this for Jesus. And this isn't just the big stuff. This is the little stuff. Brush your teeth for Jesus for crying out loud. (laughs) And would that understanding affect how I do my work? If I think about what I do, whatever I do, and that is for Jesus, how would that affect what I do? Whether that's at home or if I'm working at home or working away from home, what's a concrete step I can take to bring Jesus to my everyday, even my mundane tasks? And what can I do today before the sun sets at 5 whatever? What can I do today that will help me love God more completely, growing my percentage and getting a little closer to all in? Now, I mentioned these growing percentage, getting closer. This is not a works-based thing. This is not where you earn it. Like, you have to perform something. God's grace is sufficient. But let's get closer, right? That doesn't mean that you have to spend every moment of every day with some worship song soundtrack going on in the back of your head. You're clipping your toenails saying, thank you, Jesus, for toenails. Although you might could do that. Let's just do it all for him. Let's figure out how to do it all for him. So in my talking about our being all in or giving 100%, I haven't really sufficiently in any manner talked about the one who was all in, who became incarnate. Not just part of him. He was all God and all human being. And he didn't do magic from far away. He dwelt among us. He dwelt among us all in to show us how to live and how to love. And he gave everything, 100%, a sinless man dying a criminal's death so that we might experience every eternal blessing every day, even in the midst of storms and sorrow and joy. So this morning, we have the opportunity to partake in the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. Today, we are celebrating the life of Jesus. We're celebrating the life we have in him through his death and resurrection. We're celebrating grace and joy and hope and peace and love all of which inspire and propel us to love him and our neighbors more completely. This is no small thing. It's not a trivial tradition. This is the savior of the world, of your soul and mine, giving all of himself 100% so that we could be reconciled to him and redeemed forever. Now, friends, that's a wow. That's a wow. He did that? He did that. This is how Matthew described it. Matthew, a first-hand eyewitness in the room guy. This is what he said. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. 
Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. So if you're all in, or if you long to be, if you feel like you're not all in, but you long to be, this is for you. This is God opening his arms, saying, this is for you. Take joy. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you and we want to love you more. I want to be all in and I need you to help me see how I can devote my life more fully, how we can devote our lives more fully so that we would be 100%. We thank you for this body. We thank you for this juice. We thank you more for the sacrifice that it represents. We ask that you would be here, that you would fill our hearts, that you would fill our spirits. And that we would just bow our hearts before you in gratitude. We do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.